Let's dive a little deeper into the particle in the box. Again, we take a particle in a box with a potential zero inside, infinity outside, and we have our expression for a general solution. Um, but another question we might ask is if we were given the initial conditions for capital Psi at X comma zero, uh, what are the A sub N's, these constant coefficients in the general solution? So let's look at an example where the wave function is zero except between L over three and two L over three. Uh, so in particular, if I write that as a piecewise defined function, it's some constant between L over three and two L over three and zero outside of that region. So that's my initial condition for my wave function. First, we need to determine what is this constant C? Well, we need to enforce that our wave function is normalized so that the total probability of finding the particle is one, even for the initial condition. So that tells us that the integral from L over three to two L over three of C squared dx must be equal to one, which tells us that solving for C, that C is the square root of three over L. Okay, so now that we know C, we can figure out the A sub n's by putting t equal to zero into our general solution from above, and then use the so-called Fourier trick. And so just to remind you of the Fourier trick, it's based on the idea of orthogonality. So in particular, if you integrate from zero to L, sine of n pi over lx and sine of m pi over lx dx, you get L over two times a quantity called delta mn. This delta mn is the Kronecker delta symbol. And in particular, delta mn is zero if m is not equal to n and one if m is equal to n. Okay, so it's worth checking this orthogonality if you haven't seen it before and explicitly doing it in a couple cases. So this tells us that psi at x equal to zero, or at t equal to zero, so I plug t equal to zero in my general solution, I get the sum n equal to one to infinity, a sub n sine of n pi over l x, so that's at t equal to zero. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides by sine of m pi over l x. Then I'm gonna integrate both sides from zero to l dx, integrate zero to l dx, and then the beauty of doing this is that this integral over here is just the orthogonal integral. And so I can replace the integral on the right-hand side. I have my sum and my a sub n. I can replace it by L over two delta mn. The Kronecker delta only picks out one value from the sum, so I just get L over two times a sub m. Recall on the left-hand side that psi at x comma zero is this hat function somewhere in the middle. So this integral turns into an integral L over three to two L over three times the square root of three over L, which was our value of C, sine of m pi over L x dx. I can do that integral, it's not too bad. So then doing that integral, I get something that looks like L over m pi cosine of two m pi over three minus cosine of m pi over three. The right hand side I bring down to L over two a sub m so now I can solve for a sub m, the coefficients that I was looking for, and it's two square roots of three over m pi square root of L, cosine of two m pi over three minus cosine of m pi over three. It looks kind of nasty, but we actually have found now the a sub m. We found the coefficients for the general solution. And so now to write the general wave function, we just plug these coefficients into our general solution. So that capital Psi is just equal to the sum n equal to one to infinity. We've got this constant coefficient out front. We have the cosines of two m pi over three and minus cosine of m pi over three. There's sine of n pi x over L e to the minus i e sub n t over h bar. Okay, so this now gives the full time dependence of the wave function. Uh, and don't forget that the e sub n is the usual e sub n energy that we have. Okay, so now we have the full wave function for all time just by specifying the initial condition at t equal to zero. 
Uh, it turns out, though, that it's helpful to rewrite this in a slightly uh, better way. In particular, we can rewrite the x dependence in terms of the wave function psi sub n, which is square root of 2 over l sine of n pi x over l. These are the normalized uh, nth state wave functions of the particle in a box. So these individual wave functions are themselves individually normalized. That means that capital Psi can then be written as the sum, n equal 1 to infinity, of square root of 6 over n pi, cosine of 2 n pi over 3, minus cosine of n pi over 3, psi sub n, e to the minus i e sub n t over h bar. It simplifies things a little bit, uh, but in particular, let me just write this as the sum c sub n times psi sub n times the exponential. And that's important because then the c sub n's are the normalized coefficients of our wave functions. It turns out that this is a very useful way of rewriting a wave function uh, by writing it as normalized coefficients times solutions to the time independent Schrodinger's equation. In particular, the absolute value of c sub n squared correspond to the probability of finding the particle uh, in the state n with a particular energy e sub n. We'll talk about why that is later in the course, but for now we're just going to use that. So, for example, the probability to find the particle in the n equal to 3 state is equal to the absolute value of c3 squared, and plugging in what we have for c sub 3 here, and calculating it, it turns out it's 24 over 9 pi squared, which is about 0.27, about 27% chance of finding it in n equal to 3. The expectation value of the Hamiltonian, which is psi star h psi integrated over dx, I can now write as the sum from n equal to 1 to infinity of the absolute value of cn squared e sub n. So again, um, this expectation value of the Hamiltonian is the sum of the energies, uh, but the, it's weighted by the probability of finding the particle in that particular state, which is the absolute value of the c sub n's, which is a useful way of thinking about these coefficients.